Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture 21. So this actually, believe it or not, will be the final lecture I'm giving. Uh, then the next two class periods, we had the pleasure of hearing student presentation, which is always the highlight and pinnacle of this course. So we're really looking forward to those projects and what you've been doing. And as a reminder for the projects, if you're a little stressed about that, <laughs> remember your presentation isn't the end, right? The presentation is your chance to show what you've done to your classmates, but there will still be additional time for you to revise and improve your project between that and the final deadline. We'll be giving you some feedback. Hopefully, you can make those tweaks. Okay, but for today's lecture, what are we talking about? Well, fertile, which you may have heard me this term at some points throughout the quarter, maybe wondering what it is. And today we're going to get into that. So in particular, maybe it's better for me to motivate why we're talking about. Well, I'm going to pitch enemy representations, which is something that's usually a compiler concept from a very different point of view. Normally you hear about inter intermediate representations or IRs for short, which if you aren't sure they are yet, don't worry, we'll cover that. So it's very much in the compiler community. Okay, so something you need to build in order to have a compiler. Today I'm taking it from the point of view of a hardware designer. Why would you as a hardware designer care about an IR and how can you make that make your design better? So that's what today's gonna really be about. And so Fertile is the IR that powers Chisel. So you've been using it all quarter without you even knowing. And so yeah, we'll talk about that IR Fertile in particular. We'll talk about some, I'll actually look at the Fertile for one particular small little module, talk about some ways it goes together and also Get you excited about the fact that one of the things that's really kind of driving this recent resurgence in you know open source hardware, especially open source hardware languages, is these uh, open source IRs are really, really capable. And that's really kind of enabling a lot. Cool. Okay, so that actually will be code later in this lecture, so we might as well go ahead and load up a notebook. And well, let's kind of remind ourselves what we've been doing all quarter, right? So remember in the last lecture in the chisel grab bag, I was trying to get folks excited about really appreciating this notion of hardware construction, and that's what we're doing, right? We're using programming in Scala to instantiate hardware, right? In particular, we're orchestrating the you know, instantiation and connection of a lot of different chisel components, right? And so, keep things over and over again, right? We instantiate chisel components, we connect them all together. That's what we've been doing. And so the whole point of a generator is to automate this construction process, right? And so it can make exactly the same design every time, or perhaps it can take parameters and be more flexible and you know, adapt to what's being requested of it, right? But however you do this, right, as the developer of a generator, you need to imagine all the scenarios someone's going to use your generator in, right? So let's say you have no parameters. It's just a single static design. That's fine. It's perfectly good chisel. And depending on what your component does, that can solve a lot of people's problems, right? That can be really useful. Um, but let's say you start adding parameters to it. Every parameter you add there, you need to make sure you have support for that in the generator to actually handle those cases, right? And so. Um, as you start making this more and more parameterized, those parameters and those implementations of those parameters is very much pulled into that generator, right? Now, from making that one generator super spiffy, cool, you've accomplished your job. That generator is super spiffy. But, you know, let's say you're building a lot of code and a lot of generators. Maybe you want to start sharing these spiffy capabilities across generators. How do you do that? You might start in their problem at this point, right? Like I said, so imagine you've worked really hard to build a really cool optimization inside your generator. So it handles some really neat optimization uh, you know, not just automatically, perhaps even auto-magically, right? Really amazing. And you want to use that in other generators, right? So how could you, from a software engineering point of view, encapsulate that optimization in a way that can be used by other generators? Well, um, one way to do that is to really, really, really you know, push the boundaries of Scala, right? Maybe you can figure out a way to encapsulate what you've done in some sort of Scala class, and perhaps you can either use parameterized generic types or object-oriented inheritance as some way to kind of encapsulate that insight and let people reuse that, right? And so if someone has a generator and they want to use your optimization, they're gonna be forced to kind of fully understand your optimization code and probably modify their code substantially in order to do this, right? And so if someone trying to make this reusable optimization across generators, you have to kind of be really clever trying to think about how you support all possible generator users, right? So now you've gone from thinking the problem of someone gives me parameters, I spit out hardware, to now the problem is someone gives me a generator piece of software and I want to somehow modify that from optimization, right? So much, 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 much harder problem, right? And you can imagine maybe you succeed in doing this in one case one time. Great. What if you want to start combining multiple optimizations in multiple generators? This gets you know, unmanageable in a hurry, right? This can really come hard. And so if you think about why this is so hard, right? The problem is that you're now attacking two general problems, right? You're basically being said, I want to optimize 
basically arbitrary, arbitrary Scala, right? That's really hard. <laughs> so how would you go about doing that, right? It's too, too broad of an interface, right? It's like, how can I make traction on that? And so um, maybe another way to think about this is rather than trying to put all of these smarts we've been talking about into the generator, it actually might be less complex to intervene later on in the design flow, right? So as an alternative, rather than you know having this really complicated generation, the generation is exactly the right thing in their optimizations at the same time you're generating, what if we generate however we generate? And then later on, we go in and look at the design and optimize it. So that's the, the alternative, right? And so you know, reading a design and optimizing, it might not sound super trivial, but sometimes that'll be much, much easier than it will be to compose an arbitrary representation with an arbitrary generator, right? And so that's the kind of idea. So rather than supporting arbitrary Scala code, no, 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 we see support the hardware interface and the hardware design. And it's a much simpler you know, abstraction we're attacking. We're attacking just the hardware design rather than arbitrary Scala, right? And so, yeah, you know, well, how do we compose these optimizations? Well, if my tool takes in a hardware design and modifies it before an optimization and then spits out a hardware design, Composability is trivial, right? Because then as long as, you know, I didn't break the rules of the hardware design language, right? Uh, I can put the multiplications in a row in sequence and they can pose just great, right? And so as you're gonna learn some optimizations and transformations you wanna do to your designs, these are things that are best done is a tool flow thing rather than a generator, right? And, you know, as I kind of said in this whole course, you know, make tools do the work. Well, it's a chance for us not just to make tools do the work, but actually in our case, actually adds to the tooling, right? So sometimes you know, we think of our design as, oh, yeah, only writing the design, the tool, someone else does that. Now we're going to kind of blur the line. Now it's going to be, we're going to write the design and actually some of the stages the tools are running, but these other stages the tools are running hopefully help us. So it's kind of, you know, getting more involved. And so perhaps maybe it's better to visualize this visually. Um, so this is one of these uh, implementation difficulty kind of complexity curves. You may have seen these in that, of course, this is something that's very common in UI design, where in your horizontal axis here, we're concerned with the complexity of something we want to do. And then the Y axis is talking about how much it costs, right? So in the case of, uh, you know, this, you know, this is my conceptual mental model. Let's say you just want to build something, right? So if I want to build a simple hardware design, what's the easiest way to build it? Well, just a static design, like write it in Verilog, right? If I want to build a simple module that has no parameterizability, it might be easier if it's really simple to just write it in Verilog. Forget using a generator, right? But you can imagine as design complexity increases, especially when I have a more sophisticated parameterized thing, as you learned, you know, something like Verilog in a static language, it's going to get complicated in a hurry. And at some point, it's become like comically hard, right? It's just really, really hard. Perhaps at this point, you already have like Python spinning on Verilog for you because it's so hard to do. Um, so we've been talking about generators, where with generators, it's a little bit of a higher starting point. But as you want to do more sophisticated things, it's going to get a little bit harder, but not that much harder. Then all of a sudden, there's this cliff, right? Or I should say ramp, or you want to call it a wall, right? But it gets a lot harder. And then all of a sudden, generator, yeah, it's maybe it's better than using a static language, but it actually gets pretty hard. Because basically, like I said, you have this complexity of trying to do your optimization at the time you're generating design. And sometimes it's hard to kind of mix the two at the same time. Like there's certain things that need to result in other things. And so what we're going to talk about today is the ability of, instead, um, doing a custom transformation. The custom transformation is us adding a tool to the tool flow to perform the thing we want to do. And so this is not trivial, but for the more sophisticated scenarios where we want this, this approach will be more reasonable complexity. So ideally now we can have kind of a more linear increase in complexity we have to tolerate if you want to do more sophisticated things. So that's the goal. We'll see if we can get there. Okay. So how are we going to get there? Well, in order to have a hardware design we can manipulate, read, et cetera, we need a language for that. So for that language, this is where the IR comes in, the intermediate representation. And so in particular, what it is, it's a way to express your design in a well-defined syntax. Um, I personally, even if the IR isn't written this way, I like to think of it as a graph, perhaps biased. So you can think of it as a graph of varying node types and you know the graph edges correspond to data flow in the design. And this is anything unique to hardware design, right? So IR is a, you know, not just standard practice in compilers and flash program languages, it's like a necessary practice, right? I can't imagine writing a compiler uh, or a language without a, an IR, right? It's basically in, almost impossible to imagine that, right? Um, 
we're going to see a lot of benefits for hardware tools and a lot of benefits we're going to see for IRs and hardware tools are very much the reason why they're also highly sought after in software compilers. Um, so I'm going to say an IR is so great. Well, think about what you ask these tools to do, right? to kind of read a language, do some transformations, optimizations, and spit out another language. For example, a software compiler takes in a language like C, optimizes it, and spits out assembly for, you know, an ISA it's running on. In our case, you know, maybe we're running like a chisel optimizer, in which case we're going to take in, you know, chisel code on one end, spit out very long with some transformation applied to it. There's lots of stuff going on. And so to have a good software architecture, you want to kind of simplify things and pull out the complexity. So one way to kind of pull out this complexity is to abstract the complexity of reading the source language and then turn the source language into an IR. So that's the front end. It takes in the source language, turns into the IR. Now once we're in the IR, the majority of the compiler is going to work on this IR. It's going to manipulate the IR, optimize the IR, transform the IR, however you want to do. And then at the other end, it's going to spit out the IR with a back end to whatever target language you want to use. And so you basically can encapsulate the complexity of both the source language to the front end and the target language to the back end. And the majority of the compiler can live in a safe space of an IR, right? And so for us as someone who wants to add their own uh, tool, really we're going to be talking about using this IR. So for example, let's say we want to optimize our design. Well, if we want to add an optimization, we can add in a new pass in the middle end of the tool flow. And so it needs to speak the IR. It takes the IR in, changes it around some way, puts the IR back out, and the rest of the tools will handle that. So we don't need to worry about writing Verilog or reading Verilog. No, no, no. We just got to understand the IR, the tools will handle the rest. But let's say, you know what? Uh, maybe we don't like Chisel. Maybe we're going to go write our own uh, language in front of it. We want to make a Rust-based Chisel hardware design language. Um, does that mean you need to write everything from scratch? No, we don't. We can write a front end that goes from our Rust-based hardware design language to the IR, and then we can reuse the rest of the tool flow from there on. And this is, for example, is how with like, things like LLVM in the software world, people can easily make new languages like Rust and take advantage of a lot of really sophisticated compiler engineering. Or let's say you want to make a new target backend, right? You know, we've been targeting Verilog passes other tools, perhaps use some other language you want to target. Maybe you want to target VHDL or something. You can write a new backend. Um, that's the great thing about IRS, right? You can really just kind of encapsulate various concerns for various people, right? And so this is well appreciated in the software space. Like I said, LLVM has been a, you know, tremendous influence and success in the software world. In the hardware world, we don't really have a standardized IR, right? That's kind of been one of the big shortcomings is that basically every hardware design tool out there either doesn't have an IR or it has an IR, but it's been internal. And only in the last few years, we started to see people making these IRs, not just an IR in a hardware design tool, making the IR public and formally specifying the IR and even versioning it and keeping it consistent over time. And so having your IR for your hardware design tool is something that is public, specified, and people can interoperate with, in my opinion, is an extremely powerful enabler. Uh, and it's something that the community is not only starting to appreciate, but really taking advantage of. Cool. So to kind of show how does my look, here's a hypothetical hardware design tool that you know, takes advantage of an IR-based architecture. So you can imagine, you have all these different front ends. So whatever language you want to take as an input, perhaps you know, Verilog or Chisel, um, these all can come in. And in the IRs, the bulk of the tool, it can do various optimizations, transformations, whatever. Perhaps you as a sophisticated designer want to add one transformation yourself. You could do that, and it can work on this IR level in the middle. And then at some point, you need to spit out with a backend, right? So perhaps you spit out Verilog. Once again, you can kind of encapsulate complexity. Maybe you want to spit out Verilog specialized for ASIC versus Verilog specialized for FPGA. Uh, you can imagine maybe making Swift Plus backend or some of these other languages, right? So I put some other languages on there just kind of for fun. Uh, for example, so Py RTL or Pertle for short is a Python based hard design language uh, from our buddies down at UC Santa Barbara. LNAS is actually a language designed to be an IR, uh, produced peer by Professor Jose Renal's group. Uh, and so yeah, it's designed to be language neutral ASD, right? It's a way for you to easily kind of transform and exchange hardware designs. That's another attempt to make a publicly exchangeable um, hardware design language. But you can see the whole point, right? It's architecture. You want a new source, you write a front end, you can reuse all this, right? You want a transformation? Sure, you write something that works on IR. You want a new backend? Write a new backend. You can now support a new target. And so that's kind of the cool part of having an IR-based design. So going back to today's uh, topic, the namesake, uh, Fertile, which is the IR for Chisel. So technically, it's the flexible intermediate representation for RTL. Um, so this was developed in the context of Chisel. Uh, a few other products support it. So actually, that Pertle mentioned previously, it actually can spit out Fertile. 
And some other projects use Brittle as its own tool. So it's kind of great to already have this kind of thing out there and can use it, right? And so um, to kind of appreciate why this is so influential in this field, uh, you may have noticed all quarter they're using Chisel 3, right? So that suggests there's a Chisel 1 and a Chisel 2. Uh, actually, unfortunately, it was around for some of these other chisels, right? So Chisel 1 was so old, uh, it was an SVN, so you cannot find it on GitHub. It is non-existent. It's that old. Chisel 2 was the rewrite. We fixed a lot of things with Chisel 2. Uh, however, there's a lot of things we did horribly wrong with Chisel 2, right? Uh, in particular, it was monolithic, right? So there wasn't really an IR. Uh, it was this giant monolithic code base. And so if anybody wanted to change anything, you had to understand so much code, right? Because you understand how this thing interacted with this other thing. It was very scary. And so the Chisel free redesign done by some amazing folks, they broke Chisel into a proper language, right? As a front end, an IR, and a back end. So that IR they released was Brittle. And oh my gosh, this was such a huge improvement in complexity. A lot more folks can contribute. So it actually led to a lot of outside contributors, which wasn't even possible before because the monolithic nature of Chisel 2 made it basically impenetrable to anybody outside. Um, the second complexity was really a problem. This didn't just add bugs, it actually said discourage contributions. So we're having this rewrite with Fertile. Um, and having this IR, it made it much easier to make it correct, much easier for others to contribute, and it was really much better, right? And so when you're talking about Fertile, or really anybody in this community speak Fertile, uh, it's actually a little bit ambiguous what that term refers to. And so it's kind of worth appreciating that Fertile refers to a few things. Number one, Fertile is this IR, so it's a specification. It's actually a PDF you can go ahead and download and read the spec for it. Um, when someone also says Fertile, they're actually referring to a design in the Fertile format. So if you go digging around your source directors and you're running your various tools in this class, you may notice there's a .fir file. So that's your design in the Fertile format. And then, of course, there's the Fertile library, which is the, you know, Scala code base that actually processes Fertile, right? So, uh, for example, if you, you know, uh, in this course are producing Verilog, the actual tool flow is going to go, uh, you know, Chisel to Fertile and Fertile to Verilog. And the Fertile library is the one doing that final transformation, which I believe is going to be on this slide. Yes, it is. There we go. Okay. So, um, like I said, if you have your original Chisel design, um, it's going to run the Chisel front end, produces a .fir file, and then we call this Fertile library to actually produce the Verilog, which is using its Verilog backend, right? Okay. So it's worth talking a little bit about how this Fertile library works internally. It actually does a lot of things you keep talking about the Chisel language doing. It's actually really been done by the Fertile library. Chisel is actually a pretty thin front end. Um, so, okay, so within this IR, uh, I'm kind of curious, well, what, what can you express in this IR? Well, um, there's a handful of components, right? So what do we have? Well, at the top level, you have a circuit, right? So you have one circuit. That circuit can be made of many modules, right? Modules can have modules inside them, sure. And of course, modules, what do they have? Well, they have ports. You know, okay, yeah, sure. I have, you know, input ports, output ports, etc. Then there's statements, which is kind of the key thing. So the statement kind of does something like, you know, connect a wire, a statement can instantiate something. So most of what we think of when we think of a chisel, like what's actually doing, these are statements, right? These are instantiating things or connecting things or somehow doing something. Now, inside of a statement, you need to implement that with stuff. Okay, so a statement might have an expression. Like for example, let's have a connection where I want to say, hey, connect A to B or C, right? So you need to recognize that B or C is an expression, and then, then you're connecting that to A, right? Um, actually, it turns out, again, to the syntax details in a few slides, that uh, even just referring to an existing object is an expression. Uh, basically, everything is an expression, and then you put expressions together to make statements, and of course, all this is types, so there's types as well. Questions so far? So I'm not, I'm not sure what the Turing machine implications, but uh, yeah, so they kind of go to this question of, okay, what, what, you know, formality, what rigor is there in the Chisel language? Um, so the Chisel front end is written in Scala. So a lot of that has, you know, strong typing and stuff, right? So a lot of stuff that uh, would be potentially unsafe before the Chisel tools get a chance to run is going to be flagged as a Scala compiler, right? Um, and then things that, you know, path Scala compilation, 
there's an attempt to try and capture those errors as early as possible on the front end. Ideally, if your design clears the front end, it should be safe. Um, not always guaranteed. There's some checks are easier to do at the fertile level library. Um, and so part of the complexity, if you look at the chisel front end code, is that there's ways they could have written it one way. And there's a way they wrote it currently, which is intentional. They actually use a lot of the Scala pre-processing macros, which sounds like a really complicated thing. But the reason why I do that is it allows them to uh, intercept potential issues earlier on to give you better error messages. Where if you kind of let the program run for a while, you get an issue where you can definitely tell it's an error. If you're not going to pass on, you're not going to pass forward bad code later on the tool flow, but it's a little hard to know the exact cause of this or the exact location of the cause. So it's hard to give people good errors. And so by using preprocessor macro, they're able to kind of better localize some of these issues. Um, but the issue you asked originally of how do I give more formality to this? Um, I'm not aware of anything super formal in terms of actually like formal verification, like SMT solver kind of formal. But uh, there is a spec, which is a huge improvement, right? There's a spec, there's a lot of tests. Um, hopefully things comply to the spec and they're tested. Uh, I'm, if I'm missing something that's new in the community where they have much stronger guarantees, I'm sorry I'm missing it. Um, yeah. Well, so, so what, one of the terms people in the chisel community will say sometimes is this a notion of, they call it correct by construction. And I cringe when I hear that because, you know, just because you construct doesn't mean it's correct. But the reason why they say that is there's situations where if you give users a limited selection of options and you handle every option at every step of the way, it should kind of be correct, right? I don't like saying it's guaranteed to be correct, but like, you know, you have more confidence it might be correct, right? So that's kind of the point. So, okay, so someone instantiates, you know, extends the module, it has ports, you know, it has kind of the right structure, right? And, you know, uh, remember, for example, if you're writing uh, a chisel generator, right? If the line you're writing is purely Scala, it doesn't touch any chisel objects, it's not going to end up in chisel land, right? Only the chisel instantiations or the chisel connections end up in chisel land. And so that's kind of the point. So it's already kind of like a filtering step, right? Cool, but great questions, yeah. Um, yeah, so here's kind of the, the high level uh, IR. So for example, I was kind of talking through these things, right? You have a circuit that's composed of modules, model subports, everything's typed. Statements kind of already real components, right? Statements often correspond to roughly one line of code in either Chisel or Verilog, but not guaranteed, right? Usually it's some sort of connection or declaration, instantiation. And there's expressions, which even just referencing an existing wire or existing components, what it is, or a literal or an operation. Um, so for example, let's take a really simple module. Uh, it's gonna be simply just take something in and then pass us the register, right? So maybe I'll look at it as a Verilog first, which is, you know, probably pretty familiar to us by now. Sure, okay, yeah, there's a register, there's a module. Now instead, uh, if we wanna look at the fertile, we can, right? So here's a particular uh, textual representation of fertile. Um, and okay, so what do we see? Well, uh, you know, nothing here should be too surprising, right? Uh, interestingly, we would recognize our IO is a bundle, right? And oh wait, yes it is. You can see it's kind of wrapped in these curly braces. And even though we didn't specify anywhere by virtue of just being a module, the tools kind of automatically inserted both clock and reset. Um, okay, and you see, for example, even here in that bundle, we have, you know, in and out is the name we gave things, there's the types. Oh wait, because it's an input, that's has to be flipped. So default direction of a port is out, and so that's why a flip is an in. You can see, for example, here we instantiate um, a register called IO out reg, right? Uh, which, you know, has a certain type. It's actually it's all meta register, right? It tells you what clock it's using. It tells you what reset it's using, what reset value it's using. Um, and then how it's being output. Uh, and then, oh yeah, we connect the input to this register to io.in and we connect the output of this register to uh, io.out. So in terms of the functionalities, this is all things we've seen. It's mostly just kind of slightly different syntax you're perhaps used to seeing. So for very simple chisel modules, you're going to see a very strong correspondence with the chisel and the fertile. 
if you were to make a more sophisticated module, uh, you might start seeing a little bit more divergence. OK. So uh, let's say you actually want to go in and start debugging and playing with this stuff. There's some handy um, uh, tools. So let's say, for example, rather than looking at this fertile in the file outputting format, I actually want to see this as the uh, AST tree for that fertile. Uh, I would get this, right? Which, yikes, right? Um, you don't want to deal with this. That's what I'm highlighting. Um, that's what you get from printing it out. Now, here's the actual fertile. That's perhaps a lot better. Um, there's actually a handy tool inside the library to actually maintain the tree nesting. As you can see, the whole circuit is kind of a graph, right? So, for example, oh, yeah, you know, here's a circuit. Inside circuit, there's a list of modules. There's a module called delay. It has ports. OK, there's a you know, port for clock, port for reset. And then we have a bundle type port, which has internally some more ports. And then, OK, here's the block, which lists all the statements inside there. One statement defines the register. Here's all the details to find that register. And then here's the connection. You know, and see, even the connection, right, is referring to something. OK, I'm referring to io.out is one side of the connect. The other side of the connect is io.reg, right? And there you have it. So you can kind of see the whole thing fun together. And so, yeah, this is pretty cool if you want to be playing around this kind of stuff. But the reason why you might um, do this is if you want to start making your own transformations, right? Keeping the same design in mind, here is a you know human drawn uh, diagram of what we just saw, right? We saw, OK, there's a module called delay. So I'm not bothering to show the circuit up top. There's the ports, right? Um, they're all typed. And you can see how even the very simple module, when we actually start expressing it, it kind of blows up, right? <laughs> there's kind of a lot of details. Um, but you get the idea across, right? So now we're starting to think of our designs no longer as you know, things we as humans wrote, but perhaps now things that we can read and crawl and process designs. So for example, me and my background, I like to think of designs a lot as graph. That's perhaps why I chose to draw like a tree in this case. But what you think of as a graph or a flat text file, um, the point is that now we can start crawling and reading and manipulating designs. That's kind of the key step we're taking. And by having an IR with specified semantics, we can kind of not give ourselves too scary of a problem. It's more constrained what we're dealing with. OK, so one of the key things that the fertile refactoring that Chisel 3 did was it used what they call a the nanopath architecture. In other words, for implementing a lot of transformations you want to do inside a tool, uh, rather than having this kind of percolating and lifting, instead we take it in very small bites at a time, right? So kind of the rule is that uh, you start off your design in one format, and you keep doing many, many, many small passes. Eventually, you're in another format, right? And so each pass is a small change. Each pass accepts fertile and produces fertile. And you're just kind of changing a subtle aspect about it, right? And that's kind of the point. So now each level is kind of a much easier problem to solve. It's also easier to test, right? You can imagine you're making this tool, and it's a very arbitrary code. Like, oh my gosh, how do I get good coverage testing this? Well, if each pass you're writing has a very small change it's making, you can kind of make very controlled situations to test for that one condition much more easily, right? And this is, once again, you know, a technique as well appreciated in the compiler community, right? And so part of how Fertile goes about doing this is they actually break it into multiple levels. So we keep saying Fertile as, when, as one language. It is one language. However, we have, you know, these dialects or subsets, whatever you want to call them, that we, they actually are constrained. In particular, we have what we call High Fertile and Low Fertile. So when a tool, when the fertile first comes to us from the chisel backend, it's in high fertile, right? It's very close to the chisel. And so as a result, there's some things in there that uh, you know, are not ready to be turned into hardware. For example, chisel doesn't require a specify every bit width, right? So we may have some things with unknown bit widths, for example. Um, or perhaps the types aren't even labeled, right? So we've got to figure all that kind of stuff out. And so at some point, we need to know all the bit widths, we need to know all the types in order to make Verilog, right? And so, like I said, we come into high fertile. Through transformation passes, we fill in all this kind of unknown information. And eventually, we produce low fertile. And so what's interesting is that both high fertile and low fertile are both just fertile, right? The difference is um, what's filled in and what's not filled in. So uh, low fertile is a more restrictive subset of fertile. So it's not anything new. It's actually just a subset. It's restricted. And that's kind of the point. So we go from high fertile, we have this, you know, Everything's possible. All the features and language are available to us. And then we're going to slowly go in and start clarifying things. One of the things the tools need to do, for example, when I have high fertile coming in, is there's when statements, which 
guess what? There's not one in Verilog, right? So one of the transformations that goes through there is we have these when to turn them into the appropriate boxes and such, right? And so then at which point that design no longer has any when's left inside of it. So it's a subset of, you know, fertile that excludes when statements, for example, right? So what's nice is as you make these transformations and these passes, you can do things on the fertile. And if we as a designer want to make our own transformation, we can make it a uh, transformation that operates on fertile, right? We can just kind of go in there and do what we want to do. Cool. Okay. So uh, maybe I can give some more examples, some concrete transformations these passes do, right? So for example, as I mentioned earlier, uh, high fertile may not have every whiff specified. So there's some various passes that go in there and infer the whiffs of things. Or perhaps maybe you want to pad the whiffs. Even though Chiz allows you to have signals interacting that have different bit whiffs, for best results with Verilog tools at the other end of the pipeline, maybe we want to have all width be appropriately matched up, right? I'll make it very clear. Or as I mentioned as a minute ago, you have when statements. And those are things that are perfectly allowed and encouraged in Chisel. They're allowed inside high fertile, but by the time we get down to low fertile when we want to make Verilog, we want to instead have those turned into muxes. And uh, depending on the safety checks, some are done by Chisel, some are done by fertile. Um, and so we can do those also with some of the transformation passes. And then when it comes time to optimize the design, not just transform the design from high fertile before low fertile turn into Verilog, we can do various things. For example, something like constant propagation, a classic compiler trick. Okay, if someone creates a literal, assigns it to something, and they use that reference someplace else, well, if we replace that literal in those places it's invoked, can we make some sort of clever you know, optimization based on the logic or something like that? And sometimes you can, right? And you can kind of keep doing this again and again recursively, right? You keep reapplying this and keep simplifying things and keep simplifying it more and you see it kind of simplify down additionally. Also, something like dead code emission or DCE, right? You can go ahead and recognize, hey, this component's disconnected. There's no way to make an observe its behavior, so we might as well just cut this hardware and save people the cost, right? Or something like common so expression elimination or CSE, right? If you have a hardware block that you've written manually times, many, many times, maybe the tools can recognize, oh, wait, it's the same thing, and then Go ahead and reuse the results. These are some example transformations. I'm sure you can imagine many more. Uh, maybe I'll pause here for any questions so far. Cool. Okay. Um, so uh, I've kind of given you a whirlwind tour of what uh, Fertile is used to kind of do for vanilla chisel. And so now it's worth kind of highlighting uh, some work done to kind of show how far you can take this technology, right? Like I said, so what's amazing about this isn't just you can, you know, it makes Chisel 3 work well. It's actually you can go ahead as a super designer or a tool developer, write things that work at the fertile level and do really cool things, right? So you may have heard this project called Firestone, which is pretty neat. Uh, given a Chisel design, it'll go ahead and map to FPGA for really fast emulation, right? So if you want to run really big design and you want to run in the megahertz regime, you need an FPGA. Now you might think, oh, that's easy. I just take my chisel, generate Verilog, check that Verilog, add an FPGA tool, and I'm done, right? Not quite that simple. Um, and one of the biggest challenges in Renji is you want to make a really authentic simulation, is you're going to find that your FPGA runs at some clock rate. And if you want to simulate your design properly, you want to make sure that clock rate of the FPGA is right relative to memory. Let's say you're simulating an ASIC where it's going to be, a, let's say, a 2.5 gigahertz ASIC talking to DDR4 or 1600 memory, right? Well, if in practice your uh, design is, let's say, running at 120 megahertz on FPGA and it's talking to 800 megahertz DDR3, right, the relative speeds of your processor to memory, it's all whack, right? It's not going to match up. You're going to get the wrong results. And so what's cool about FireSim is it goes in and virtualizes time. So it appropriately looks at the time you're requesting for things, and it can automatically pause things. We need to pause things. It can buffer things, FIFOs. You know, have one thing pause, another thing runs multiple times to catch up or get ahead, whatever you need to do. And what's cool is that you don't need to do this manually, right? You just give it a chisel design. It's going to use it, turn that chisel design into fertile, and it's going to do all these transformations and manipulations on your design with the fertile. So that's the point. They wrote this really cool tool. It doesn't need to speak chisel, it just needs to speak fertile, and it kind of does all this, right? And actually, Pickler and FireSim it is designed to run Amazon Cloud FPGAs, so the one of those Pickler uh, details, which they're working to make it more easy to run at home. But, um, this point is out, so it's pretty sophisticated tooling, right? Imagine if someone told me uh, I had a tool that could take any Verilog and like automatically, uh, you know, run it on FPGA to get the right speeds for memory and stuff, install it and stuff. That'd be really intimidating, really hard to do. 
But fortunately, because, you know, Fertile exists, they were able to kind of use this existing library and make this happen. It actually was a grad student project. Uh, it succeeded. It's been pretty impressive. And so uh, last I heard, sci Five was in the process of redoing this project in a much larger and much more robust scale uh, for commercial application. Um, one of the spinoffs from the uh, FireSim project was this Golden Gate sub-project, we want to call it. Uh, and so they took the same FireSim technology. You know what? That's really cool. We want to take it one step further and recognize, OK, if I have the exact same hardware design, and I have, let's say, like four copies of it, rather than having each copy of its own piece of the hardware on FPGA, why not put one copy of it on FPGA and then very cleverly keep track of time and data and reuse the same FPGA resources, right? So it's multiplexing the same design uh, on the hardware. Um, so it's really clever, really cool. Uh, but yeah, once again, this is all done by fertile transformations, right? So you can go ahead and read fertile, uh, and you can use the library to do a lot of stuff for you automatically. So these are things you can go ahead as a Trill developer, just manipulate fertile, and then trust the tools to give you a front end, the back end, other optimization, safety checks, those are all kind of given to you for free. Um, so it's pretty cool. And then, uh, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention some research from my own research groups. So so that's just a project in my own research group. Uh, so what it is, it's actually a, technically a fertile simulator. But more generally, what's this cool claim to fame? It's actually the fastest cycle accurate software RTL simulator. It's a little bit mouthful, but it's pretty cool, right? So how do we do that? We do a lot of really, really clever uh, optimizations. But what's fun for us doing this research is that we spend all of our time thinking about what we want optimizations to be, right? OK, what's the most cool thing we want to do and how we generate code? How do we make things go faster? That's we spend the vast majority of our time. And the reason why we're able to do all that is we're built on top of the Fertile library, right? So by using the same Fertile library that's powers as Chisel 3, we get a front end. Uh, it provides us backends. In our case, we actually wrote our own backend for C++. So our tool essence takes in designs in Fertile, manipulates them, fits out C++ code you can compile and make a very fast simulator. So we actually have our own backend technically. But um, we still use a lot of this Fertile code, right? And so to kind of see the benefit of this, for example, so Verilator is perhaps the, I would say, the second fastest world <laughs> software RTL simulator in the world, right? So only slower to us. It's faster than all the commercial tools for software RTL simulation. It's really fast. It's really cool. Um, it is a project from the early 90s with a significant development team supporting it now. So it's, you know, a now nearly 30-year-old code base. Last I checked, this is a few years old, greater than 100,000 lines plus plus code. And it's competing against our code base, which is about 5,000 lines of Scala. Right, so I'm not counting the fertile code, because that's code we were able to inherit. We didn't have to write that code or maintain that code. That's free code to us. I believe fertile code is around 15 and 25,000 lines of, uh, of Scala. And we were able to build the code that does more sophisticated transformations than the Verilator does. That's why we're faster. We have kind of more clever mappings. And that's a productivity win, right? So it's not just Scala versus C++. It's actually the fact that, yeah, you know, a lot of the hardware transformation, hardware processing stuff handled by the fertile library, we instead um, can really focus on uh, what's the speed. And I should also point out this code source line comparison is totally fair. There's plenty of things Verilator can do that Essent cannot do. Essent's definitely you know drag racing tool designed to make really fast simulators and nothing else. But um, kind of the sense, right? You can go ahead, go out and go out and build a pretty cool hardware tool by building on top of one of these IRs. So it's kind of a neat thing to kind of do. So um, you know, it says summer slide, I'm actually talk from memory in a few places to make sure we kind of cover <laughs> the basics here, right? So um, the ending of this lecture was kind of mostly focused on examples of using IR to build your own tools, which is definitely one thing to do. There are plenty of examples where you could want to use the IR as a, a sophisticated designer. So for example, let's say, imagine you are developing a chip and it's a big ASIC chip and you decide, you know what? we want to insert a scan chain for JTAG, right? Okay, we want to do a JTAG scan chain, sure. You could go ahead and do some sort of clever Scala generator and, you know, add this, you know, maybe even better yet, a Scala trait, add this trait to all of your generators, all of your modules, it's pain in the butt. Or you could write a fertile transformation that crawls the fertile and inserts the scan chain for you, right? Or maybe you want to do something else where you want to like pull out stuff for high performance counters, there's a lot of things you want to do your design. It's easier to do it at the fertile level than it is to do it at the generation time. And so that's kind of hoping you're excited about it. The hardware IR is really kind of cool to have this now public and open. Uh, you can make your own tools. You can make really cool interactions with your own designs. Um, and 
what makes it even more exciting for me is this is really growing up. So today was all about Fertile, which is the IR for Chisel. Um, I would say as of today, it's probably the most interoperable uh, IR, but that may very quickly change. Uh, so for example, the IR for Yosis, which is a very commonly used tool, open source, is RTLIL. Uh, Yosis is so capable on its own, I don't think people usually have a reason to extend it. That's why I would say RTLIL is not is commonly used outside that project. But uh, Yosis is amazing what it can do, and a lot of people use it, and so RTLIL is how it works internally. There are some other IR research products from other universities, for example, CoreR from Stanford, LLHD from ETH, and then uh, Last but definitely not least is Circuit, which I should spend maybe a minute talking about. Okay, so Circuit uh, is yet another IR, uh, but it's not just another IR, right? It has a few different goals in mind. Number one is attempting to be kind of like a big tent, everyone's included IR. So it actually has support for IRs within IR. It's taking advantage of the MLIR capabilities from LLVM. So the MLIR is multi-level IR, so you can have you know IRs within IRs. Um, and so as a result, uh, there's a lot of IRs available inside Circuit. One of the IRs inside Circuit is Fertile. And so the people pay, cutting the check for most of us development right now is sci fi You've heard me allude to the fact that there is a faster backend for Chisel. Well, the faster backend is referring to is actually a Circuit-based backend. So Circuit coming from the LLVM community is written in Swift Plus. So there's a certain set of code bases there, certain optimizations, it's a lot faster. And so the plan for Chisel, which we're using Chisel 3.5 all quarter, Chisel 3.6 is in release candy stage, but not fully released. When it's fully released, it's gonna change things. So Chisel 3.5, uh, Scala front end, you know, Chisel to Fertile, and they call it the Fertile library, which is written in Scala to take the Fertile to Verilog. Starting in 3.6, which you basically, you know, almost released, it'll have a Chisel front end, still written in Scala, to produce the Fertile, and then the Fertile to Verilog will be done by a circuit backend. And that's a lot faster. So the initial benchmarking is impressive how much faster it is. Um, for you as a user, the time is only moderately faster because you're partially bottlenecked by the speed of Scala front end. Right? Because even though you've made the back end a lot faster, it's still the Scala based front end. But it's still pretty cool. But it's also exciting for a lot of our projects where if you want to go ahead and build your own new hardware design tool, perhaps we target the circuit IR, you can interrupt with a lot of other projects. The circuit has a lot of front ends, a lot of back ends. It's under rapid development, it's still being developed, um, but it can be exciting. So it's kind of a really fun landscape with all these different tools out there. Whew. Okay, questions? Okay, well, before we wrap up, I wanna do two things. Number one, as you saw on the Slack, in case you weren't aware, student presentations, Wednesday and Friday. Even if you're not presenting, please come both days. Support your classmates, see what you're doing. I'm sure it's gonna be cool. It's always cool every year. Uh, so come check it out. Um, following presentations, we as staff that night are gonna send you an email with some feedback about anything we saw. Usually, like nine times out of 10, it's something where we requested some content and you didn't present that content, and then it's an opportunity for you to go ahead and fill that content in. Remember, there's gonna be your presentation this week and then your final submission next week. Uh, and so that's a chance for you to kind of fill in any gaps. And so go ahead and look at that webpage, which lists the content we're expecting. So you can include stuff not on that list, but you should try to make sure you at least address the things on that list. Um, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, as you've experienced, this is a course we're really excited about, and we really wanna hear your feedback. So this is, you know, that time of year here at Santa Cruz, it's set season. So please go ahead and fill out these surveys. We really do care about them. Um, like other instructors to incentivize responding, uh, we will give a small amount of credit for those who respond. I'll be turning on an assignment on Canvas. So you can go ahead and upload a screenshot that proves you did it. These are anonymous results. We can't tell what you answered. <laughs> um, so please go ahead and fill them out and also get the extra credit. And because this class is so small, every voice really counts. But I also have this additional thing, if all students in this class turn in the survey, we have a 100% return rate, which has actually happened the last two times, so let's get three in a row, uh, I will double dex credit. So uh, as a reminder, you actually don't have all day, you actually have only until this coming Sunday night. So we have six days. And so uh, part of why this lecture is done, how much early? 20 minutes early. Here's class time for you to do the sets, right? I want people to do the sets, I value the sets. I can speak for my colleagues as well. We all really value the sets. Please do the surveys. It really helps us. And so here's some time for you to do it uh, in class time. No extra time taken out of your schedule. Uh, cool. Uh, any last questions? Presentations, I'm asking groups to target 15 minutes. 
Uh, I imagine sometimes students, when they give presentations in practice, they vary dramatically relative to what they intended. But from my personal experience, I recommend 15 minutes. So yeah, please do practice and see how you come out. Uh, and maybe perhaps a little bit longer for two-person groups and a little bit shorter for one-person groups, right? All right, sounds good. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and unplug and walk out and let you folks do your sets anonymously. Uh, and remember, we can't see these surveys until after grade is submitted, like weeks after the quarter. So it's really just to help us improve the future. And yeah, you're benefiting from it uh, right now.